On this episode of Behind the Mic with Nick Morgison, we sit down with one of the people from the British Invasion, Peter Noon, who's from one of the original groups, Herman's Hermits. And we sit down and we talk about the 1960s and how he got to do all these different types of music and how he started by doing uh, parodies of Buddy Holly music and how he went on to do his own music and how he got to collaborate with different people. And you just get a whole rich history of what goes on in the 1960s and how you kind of see how it's adapted into today's music. So let's go behind the mic with Peter Noon. In 1963, you joined a group called the Heartbeats, which eventually became Herman's Hermits. Can you talk a little bit about where the name of the group came from? Um, well, the Heartbeats, let's start with the Heartbeats. Well, the Heartbeats was like a Buddy Holly, um, a Buddy Holly inspired band. And it, it just went around little clubs in Manchester, and we, did lo- and we did lots and lots of Buddy Holly songs. So we thought we were like um, a Buddy Holly. Um, I can't think of the word, parody, parody. And um, we used to rehearse in this pub. Um, In England, the pubs in those days closed at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and opened again at 6 o'clock in the evening, 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the evening. And in that break there, that three-hour break, there was nobody in there, just the the publican who owned the place would clean it up and, you know, dust off the tables and wash the glasses. And we made an arrangement that we could rehearse in this pub between, you know, when we finished school at 4 o'clock until 5.30 when they kicked us out, if we would do a free concert for him on Friday night. So we agreed that that was it. So we had a place to rehearse and a stage and a PA and all that stuff. And, and um, the one day we were doing, like, a little things, and I used to wear these horn-rimmed glasses when I was doing a Buddy Holly song. And the, the, the publican is wiping the tables off there. And he says, who, who are you supposed to be? You know, with this Manchester accent. I said, well, can't you see? It's like Buddy Holly. He goes, you don't look like Buddy Holly. You look like Sherman from the Bullwinkle show. <laughs> so so all, the, all the hermits laughed, and the, all the heartbeats laughed. And he said, what are you laughing at? You all look like bloody hermits. So we thought we were Sherman's hermits which quickly go, no, no, we should call it Herman's Hermit so you don't get confused with your lookalike. So we became Herman and the Hermits, and suddenly we crept away from those Buddy Holly songs, which we did loads of, loads of romantic and happy, beautiful Buddy Holly songs, and we started to look for odd songs that went with our odd name. And that's where we came up with, like, Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter. We used to do My Boy Lollipop, which was a, a girl's song. But it seemed great that we could do it. You know, we'd go on stage and we'd sing My Boy Lollipop. My Boy Lollipop. And, and people thought, well, that's weird. And then we would do lo- Mother-in-Law, like, which was only K-Do, Mother-in-Law. Mother-in-Law. And, and it was kind of only we knew that the joke was on the, on the audience because 50-year-old boys didn't have mother-in-laws. You know what I mean? So we found all these odd songs that no other bands did in, 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 in Manchester and Liverpool you had to be different from everybody else. You couldn't, couldn't get a job if you were the same as the Beatles or the same as Jerry and the Pacemakers or the same as Freddie and the Dreamers or the same as the Kinks or the same as the Who or the same as the Beatles. Everybody had to be different. So Herman Summit started to travel and get loads of dates because we were totally unique. There was no other band doing the kind of music or the type of songs that we were doing. And so slowly that unraveled that we got to be the busiest band you know, we would we had more dates than everybody else, sort of like now. And um, as we travelled more and more, we got a bigger, bigger following until we were the last group left left in Manchester who hadn't been signed to a label. So then it was our turn, and we got signed to a label. And we by then we 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 wanted to be able to choose who, who the label was. And we'd heard that the Stones had this wonderful producer called Andrew Oldham, who'd stopped them from being with a label unless they were independent. So we decided that we wanted to be 
independent. We wanted to produce the records and give it to the labels and say, now all you've got to do is put it out. Because labels then, like now, wanted to change the finished product. No, go and put some violins on it. And, of course, for Herman's Hermits, we wouldn't have had a second verse, same as the first. We would have been sent home to write a second verse for Henry VIII. Do you get my? Do you see what I'm saying? So we wanted to be independent and and outside of all that um, EMI uh, Sex Pistols world. You know, the thing that Sex Pistols didn't want was having somebody telling you what you can do. So we we managed to do that, and we found Mickey Most, who could play the guitar, and he didn't play golf, and all the things that we decided we wanted, we got. We got the perfect record producer, and the best part about him is, first of all, he was my best friend. He was the best man at my wedding. He's my daughter's godfather, and he could pick hits. So you we were talking about Hermits Hermits. It was part of the British invasion that was storming into the United States in the 1960s. There were other groups, as you just talked about, uh, notably being the Beatles. Were the groups that were part of the invasion friendly? You know, it was uh, the British invasion in England. We didn't know there was a British invasion, but there was a very small... It was a very small... England is a very small country. Even if you include Scotland and Wales into it, it's still pretty small. So, for example, the people that we knew were people who ended up in other bands. For example, I was friends with... I knew Jack Bruce, and he was in a band called the Graham Bond Association. And sometimes I would see them in their van, and we would... Because we lived near each other, we would pick up members of the Graham Bond organization, and they'd come with us because they lived nearer than the van driver. You know, like that story that Ringo was the last one to be dropped off and all that, that stuff. So we would, we would all mingle, and, and it was kind of... It was an amazingly small scene, and I think we had five different newspapers that only dealt with the music scene. There was the New Musical Express, there was the Record Mirror, there was the Melody Maker... And, and the disc, and they all dealt just with music, you know, just bands. And so you you look in the paper, and you'd get one of these papers every Thursday or Friday, whichever day they came out, and you'd be able to see where the Beatles were playing and where the Undertakers were playing and where you might be able to find a job if you were going to work. You know, this was before Rolling Stones and all those sort of stupid magazines that talk about nothing. It was all for musicians. All the, all the newspapers were full of musicians and fans of music. So there was no pictures of people, you know, posing. It was like bands. So there was a place, that's famously in England, it's part of the British music scene, there was a place called the Blue Ball, and everybody travelled in vans in those days. It was the beginning of self-contained music. Like, if you could get everybody that you needed on stage in a van, you could work. So, you know, the Beatles were the first. They, they broke it down to four. Uh, but we had five, and we all got in vans, and we all drove around, and those vans would have to stop in gas stations. And when they stopped in gas stations, people would want... There was no alcohol around in those days, in these, late at night. Everything closed at 11 o'clock. And you would go to these transport cafes where there were loads of truck drivers who wanted to beat you up. And um, loads of musicians. So you would see... Uh, you know, bits and pieces of the Beatles and the Undertakers and the Kinks and the who weren't quite going yet. But, you know, all the bands that became like, like Noel Redding was in a band and I would see him there and he was a friend of mine. He was always a friend of mine. He was in Jimi Hendrix experience. And, you know, well, everybody eventually landed in. The better you were and the longer you'd been out on the road, the more likely you were to get into a band that was worthwhile. Like Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker were both in probably in that Graham Bond organization. So you would see them and Eric Clapton and, and Jimmy Page was in these funny little bands that he was just part time and with you know he was in like nine bands. You, who you with today? You know, it would just it was a workaholic kind of guy. So so everybody knew each other and or, or we knew who we were. You know, we, we'd all do, like like some of these. We, we broke out of our little neighborhood. As we got a bigger and bigger following, we played more and more further away from our home thing. And so we knew that there was a band called the Ravens who would come to Liverpool because they were entertaining, and they were the Kinks. And bit by bit, people grew into other bands, and, you know, Ginger Baker went on to be in, like, nine bands. The only other kid who was the same age as me was Steve Winwood when he was in the Spencer Davis group. So you would see him everywhere. So it was a very small friendly scene, you know, because we were not comp we weren't competitors. We were all 
unique. Herman Summers wasn't like any other band, and the Beatles wasn't like any other band. So, so you know, there was a place for everybody. We all played the same audiences, and, you know, there's, there's somebody in the audience for everybody. There's some girls who like Herman Summers, and there's some girls who like the Rolling Stones. So, Peter, it seems that you have adapted well from one generation to another. You started out during the British Invasion, and now you're a part of the uh, Internet generation. Uh, what, does it, what does it take to constantly reinvent yourself to take advantage of the current generation? I don't know about reinventing. I've always been a persistent little person. So, you know, if it, if it requires a lot of my attention, I usually uh, put the time in, you know. I mean, the, the, the reason Herman Sermits made it in the first place was we were very persistent. So every, every part of the career has required, you know, being pushy and persistent or just, you know, learning, the, learning how to write code and then, and then do it, you know. But... None, none of it is none of it is found easily. You just keep readjusting to do what you've got to do. It's like that. I, I like it whenever, like for example, when Instagram comes out. I don't know how it works, but I join straight away on the first day, and then I learn it, and then I, you know, I'm one of those people. You know, I, I always pretend that I'm much smarter than I am, and just keep moving along. So I've read that you have a large and loyal fan base around the world. Uh, why do you think that your fans stay with you year after year? Well, first of all, it, 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 keep, it doesn't... There's, there's some older ones, but there's some younger ones as well. And I think because the music is, is friendly, it's user-friendly. If you think Herman's Hermit's songs are about people falling in love and romance and, and stuff like that. And there's, there's no age limit for that. You know, people, when they're 62 like to think about falling in love the first time and who they went to school with and everything. And people who are at school like to hear songs about falling in love because they're probably doing all those things again. For the, you know, they're doing those things that we did in, in those songs, like Woke Up This Morning Feeling Fine, I Met a New Girl Last Night in the Neighborhood, or Don't Know Much About History. The only odd one is uh, Mrs. Brown Got a Lovely Daughter, or I'm Henry VIII, because that takes some, uh, that takes some Stanislavski method to believe that you are Henry VIII. So I, I read that you are truly a multi-dimensional performer. You have been on the Broadway stage, British and American TV, the movies, and also a radio host. Uh, do you believe this adds to your appeal? You know, it's not, it's not really appeal. I don't know if that adds to my appeal, but, you know, I, I like to be busy. So if you've given me a day off and I've got nothing to do, I will find something to do. And if it appeals to me... That's all that counts, really. I'm not quite sure if I care whether it appeals to you, but I know if it appeals to me, then I'm okay because I'm Joe Public and probably what I like, other people like. Like, for example, my radio show is the 60s on 6, and it only deals with songs from the 60s. And because I was a member of one of those bands in that 60s thing, and I did run into Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and, Mar you know, and, all the, and Elvis Presley and the Beatles and all the songs that I play, I think I'm better placed than some disc jockey who was in Poughkeepsie. So, uh, as I as talking about your uh, Sirius XM show, I've actually had a chance to listen to your show, Something Good with Peter Noon, which you said is on the Sirius XM 60s on 60 channel. Uh, you seem to have a really good time telling stories and reflecting on the 60s. Uh, is there a lot of preparation for the show, and do you look forward to doing the show? Well, there is no preparation for the show. I just have a list of songs, and I pick one out, and I choose the stories. It's like a the next week's show, I just go through a list of hundreds and hundreds of songs, and I go, oh, I've got a Hollies story, and I circle that, and then I tell a story about the Hollies, and they play that record. Oh, I've got a Yardbird story, and I circle that one. You know, eventually I'll run out of stories, so right now it's just running along. It's all a bit, it's all a bit stream of consciousness, the whole thing. I set up a microphone, and I start talking, really, and then they, the music is put in. You know, first, first of all, I would never talk about a song that I haven't listened to right before I talk about it. Because I think, uh, you know, they have to be fresh in my head. You know, I have to be in the same key as the record when I talk. So, you know, um, so, so I think I'm very well placed to talk about the 60s, and I have a good sense of humor, and, I'm, and it's kind of self-deprecating. You know, I always make everybody else um, win the argument, kind of, if it's a story about falling out and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I was there, and I was in the dressing room with the Beatles, so it's kind of all... It's kind of all, it's kind of cooler than a regular DJ. So I'm enjoying it because I, I get to tell my funny stories about 
you know, I met John Lennon and he said to me, who are you? So, you know, those are good stories, I think. So in the 1970s, your acting career seemed to have taken off with appearances on uh, ABC's musical version of the Canterville Ghost Hallmark ha. Hallmark Hall. Sorry, I left. Uh, Hallmark Hall of Fame's presentation of Pinocchio and MGM movies, including Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter, Hold On, and When the Boys Meet the Girls. Uh, did you put your music career to the side to pursue acting, and did your music career help your acting career? Um, I think all of, those, all of those acting jobs that you mentioned all had music in them as well, so they're all complementary, I think. You, you, you know, I like to think that it all adds up. You know, so every now and then I meet people who saw me on My Generation in the 90s and that, that's how they know me or they saw me on Married with Children. and it, it, It's all complimentary. I think just so long as people hear the name Peter Noon and they put a face to it or a song to it, then I'm winning the game. So from uh, 1989 to 1993, you hosted VH1's My Generation. Uh, that led VH1 to select you as their Viewer's Choice Sexiest Artist of the Year. How was it to work on a TV show that reflected back on the music that you were a part of? That was great fun because, once again, I was just telling stories, and I'm a pretty good storyteller. And uh, sometimes I make up the story, but the audience have to guess which one is true and which one is fake. So that was good for me. I mean, at least it got my face on the television for a while there, you know, for that MTV network. So uh, Hermits Hermits was a very successful band, as we keep talking about, in the 60s, selling over 60 million records, including 14 singles and seven albums going gold. Can you share with me why you feel the group was a major success? It's about songs, really. We had great songs, the same as the Stones had great songs. You know, there was the songs represented the band and the band represented the songs. So, you know, I mean, when, it's, when I do live shows, I've got I'm Into Something Good, Wonderful World, there's a kind of hush all over the world. Silly ones. I'm Henry VIII, I am which the audience all sing. Silhouettes, uh, the end of the world. You know, I've got all these great songs. A must, she's a must to avoid. And you just get up there and, you know, not many bands can do an hour without doing other people's songs. You know, this, this, it used to be, you know, people, uh, Roy Orbison once said to me, like, um, you know, there's not many people who can go up there for an hour and just do their own hits. And at the time, there was. You know, now the Beatles aren't touring anymore. Paul McCartney can go on for an hour and do his own hits. I can. Roy Orbison isn't touring anymore. The Bee Gees aren't touring anymore. So it's me and the Beach Boys, really, isn't it? So uh, talking about uh, the song I'm Henry the Eighth I Am was part of a list of, uh, ten, top, a list of top ten records that included uh, Can You Hear My Heartbeat, Silhouettes, Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter, Wonderful World, Just a Little Bit Better, A Must to Avoid, Listen, Listen People, and Leaning on a Lamppost. Can you, can you explain a little bit about the sound of the Herman, Herman's Hermits that made them so popular? Um, I think it was just honest. They were honest, straight-ahead, and glossian themed band and songs. You know, we picked a song. We chose our songs. We always wanted to be the person who played, who the DJ would play right after the news, you know, the prime spot. So, so we, we made records for the radio, and we were the... Me, I was the same age as the people who bought records, and I was a fan of records. So, you know, sometimes I would look at the charts and I'd go, oh, my goodness, look, Rack Doll is in the charts, and oh, you, oh Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison. We don't have a chance, but, you know, there was a chance for everybody. We all sort of shared the charts, and, and, and we made the kind of records at the time that fit. But, the, you know, records are of the moment, and I think Herman's Hermits were of their moment. There was a space in the world for Herman's Hermits, so we made records unknowingly that, that fit into the spot that was missing. You know, the Stones were doing Little Red Rooster for the Rhythm and Blues fans, and we were doing I Mean It's Something Good for the Little Girls and the Little Boys, actually. You know, we quite amazing enough, I think it worked out about 50-50 for Herman's Hermits because it wasn't... You know, you didn't have to choose John, Paul, George, or Ringo in my band. You just had to choose the songs. So th throughout the 70s, you performed and composed songs and produced recordings with such artists as David Bowie, Debbie Boone, and Graham Golden. Can you talk about what it was like to perform with these people throughout your career? Well, all that's great. You know, I mean, I do that. I, I've always done that. I've, I've all, what happened in the period that I came up in, in, in the music business, like if Jimmy Page was in the next studio... He would come in and say, 
hey, I got this idea for that song you're doing, and he would play the guitar on Wonderful World. He did on Herman Hermit's Wonderful World. Or John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin also would do all our arrangements. He did all the musical arrangements, like There's a Kind of Harsh Normal Today. All those songs were arranged, and pl- the bass player is John Paul Jones uh, from Led Zeppelin. So always, we've always jumped in on each other's sessions. It's like just this year, I've done a session with Ginger Baker. I did the, a Who tribute thing with Ginger Baker and... And Peter from Yes, who unfortunately just died, um, Peter Banks. So we did a session where we all, you know, people just do that. And sometimes you get a credit for it, sometimes you don't. But all along, I've always been involved in other people's records. I've shown up as a fan at their sessions, and, they've, and I've said, hey, I've got a good harmony for that, and they put it on. You know, I even did an Elton John record. Me and Bruce Johnson from the Beach Boys did an Elton John record. We didn't get any credit for it, but we are the, the voices, the background voices. We just... You know, it's just the music business isn't, you don't, what, what happens to it as it's slowly, as more and more people think of it as like this big money game, less and less, people get less and less creative. You should just be able to walk into a studio and if you've got a good idea for somebody's song, that's just a favor. It isn't, hasn't got a price on it. Now you hear all these people who say, well, I came up with that lick, I deserve some money. I saw the, there's a great Beware Mr. Baker movie out there that everybody should see where he explains, you know, he was part of this band called Cream, but Eric and, and the other guy wrote songs. So he's broke, and they've got hundreds of millions of dollars because the drummer was... He, 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 just because he was the arranger didn't mean he got paid as an arranger. The songwriters get all the money. So, you know, they did that unknowingly, and they made great music because they just shared each other's brilliance. And I, I like to think that every time I work with somebody else... They must like my idea, otherwise I won't have got on the record. They would say, yeah, very nice, and then he raised me. And the same when somebody's on my record. If it's good, I keep it. If it's not, it's, it's gone. Magnetic heaven. All right, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Nick. It's great talking to you.